Hello, students, and welcome into uh, week eight. So this is our uh, lecture for uh, the midway point of our course, week eight. So we don't have a midterm. We just keep rolling with our um, explorations of the Earth. So uh, by now, you're familiar with this page. It's our Canvas dashboard. So we're going to hop right on into our Earth Science class. And as always, the contact info, the syllabus info, how you are graded, and then the link to all the modules. So you will see, since we are in week eight, we have a week eight module. Uh, these modules stay open the whole course, so you can always go back into them. But if we go to the week eight module, we will see our familiar friends there. So the week eight discussion board, uh, this lecture that you're listening to right now, the link to CK12, and then just simply the Igneous Rocks PowerPoint that uh, we will be using for the lecture. So this week we start with Igneous Rocks. I'm gonna start with the discussion board. So that's where you should always start. It's a great primer uh, for the lesson that we're gonna go through. And this week's discussion board is a little bit different uh, because it's just normally it's just like a YouTube video sort of going over a topic we're going to be talking about. Uh, but this one, I just did a video uh, because I want us thinking about two different types of igneous rock as we go through this. Uh, we saw from the rock cycle that we have igneous rocks, we have metamorphic and sedimentary. This week's uh, lecture and this classwork is dedicated solely to igneous rocks because they are very, very important. They're kind of the parent rock of all rocks. And so this uh, video, you watch it, You uh, the questions are in there, they're at the end of the video, you answer them on the reply, you get full credit. Don't pass this up, this is 10% of your grade, like we say, and uh, it's a full letter grade. And so something we easily want to get our points on, and it's also, like I said, a good primer, it'll make sense as we go through the lecture. And then, uh, so obviously this is gonna be where you're, uh, you can find this lecture and you can watch it as many times as you like. You could bump up my YouTube uh, view members or view numbers, and uh, maybe soon here I'll be a YouTuber and I'll be rich enough not to uh, have to teach. I shouldn't say I have to teach. I enjoy it very much. And uh, I can say right now, nobody's going to be paying me to advertise on a YouTube channel where I just talk about rocks. Ain't going to happen. Anyway, so other than that, uh, here's the PowerPoint we're about to go over, but let's talk about our ck12.org work. So if I click on that, we get the little link following it out. So I'm gonna follow it on out and go to my classes. And so uh, so this is, is good to see. More people are getting work done. And even if I go to Earth's Interior, which is the one that you had for like two weeks, more people are getting it done. It's now up to 13. Please keep going with that. Uh, and if you have not started anything on CK12, for the love of everything, holy, get started on it. Otherwise, uh, it's just gonna start to look like you're not in the class and then uh, they're going to be contacting me for like uh, uh, students to drop, and that's who I would have to drop if you've done nothing whatsoever. If you are participating uh, in any way, shape, or form, you're fine, but don't let this stuff uh, stay till the very end. Otherwise, you will not have a good time. So the rocks and minerals one, this is the new one. Uh, that, I shouldn't say new one, it's one we had last week. And uh, so 10, 10 people are already done with it. Great. Stay up with that. Stay on it. You'll just make your life a lot easier. And so now as we go into this class, what I'll be able to do with you is I'm going to go to our assignments. And so we have an available assignment that I'm gonna assign to you right now, Igneous Rocks. Uh, the due date on this, it's gonna be the end of the month, so the last Thursday. Remember, we, I have to put those due dates in there because uh, I need to make sure that we're keeping up on our work. So I am assigning that now, and it is now part of our class assignments for the month of March. And so if we click on igneous rocks, you can see what your tasks are. So it's only igneous rocks this week. Three small sections, one small quiz. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to go over some of the quiz answers. So it's beneficial for you to watch until the very end. Or maybe I'll go over them in the middle. You know, you don't know. You got to watch the whole thing. But anyway, so just three sections just on igneous rocks, intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks, which is the focal point of our lecture today and then igneous rocks classification, and then our quiz. So as typical on these sections, you will have articles to read, which will back up the knowledge you learn in the lecture. Uh, now, for the lecture, I usually go through these um, articles and these real-world examples and incorporate them in there. So watching the lectures kind of gives you the overview of all the CK12 steps. You don't necessarily have to read through all these and do all the activities, all you have to do is really uh, watch the lectures and then use this to boost up that knowledge and to help you along in the adaptive practice. So you could read these articles. You could uh, watch the videos, which usually relate to the questions in the adaptive practice. There are study guides. There are activities. There's real-world examples. Utilize all of them to enhance your knowledge and to make the adaptive practice easy. Then also at the very end, you'll make your quiz very easy as well. 
So that's the basics of our CK12. It's just stuff we already know and can go over. Uh, just make sure you're staying up on it. If you have questions on it, let me know. If you're struggling on any questions individually, let me know. If you're signed up for the Remind app and you reach a question on an adaptive practice or a quiz that you don't get, take a picture of it, send it over to me. We'll work through it together. I don't want you struggling. I want us learning, All right? So now let's hop back to our Canvas page. And uh, so the last thing we have to do is we have to go over this PowerPoint of igneous rocks. And so we're gonna do that now. So this will this is the little link that'll take you out to this PDF. So this isn't our typical PowerPoint. I pulled this off of a geologic website because it's just very, very good. And uh, so we're gonna go through it, but this will always be here waiting for you as a study guide and you won't have to hear my voice or see my little picture down in the corner here. Uh, so let's hop into it. We're not gonna beat around the bush this time, as they say. We're gonna go right into it. All right, so hop and open. I'm gonna make it big and nice and easy for us. So this is not chapter five. I don't know what chapter this is, but uh, we are just rolling along in our um, in our studies. We have taken it from the big picture of the universe to the earth, moon, sun system, to the layers of the earth. And now we're looking at the rocks and minerals. And now we're getting a little bit more uh, uh, defined in what we're looking at. We're looking at igneous rocks and their origin. Where do they come from? So uh, this would be really important. I'm sorry, I like itchy nose. I just, it's going to drive me nuts. Uh, this is really important because especially being in California, we are surrounded by all types of rocks. We got igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary, and uh, California is really just like a geological playground that I, I hope after this class, you maybe get out and play around in and, and see some of the things that we talk about. And now we get to talk about them. So here we go. We saw in the rock cycle that we generally have three different types of rocks that all the other like uh, classifications fit into these main types. We have igneous, which are formed from uh, uh, volcanic eruptions or magma within the earth cooling there. This could be internal or external. That is the focus of the, uh, what you want to call it, um, uh, discussion board video, uh, intrusive and extrusive rocks. Uh, so we also have sedimentary rocks, which are formed from erosional processes, and then metamorphic rocks, which are another type of rock that's been heated and pressurized until it forms something new. So uh, <clears throat> let's keep moving along. I'm sorry. It's one of those that's weird. I can hear there's like a delivery person right outside my door, and I know the second they knock, my dog is going to go nuts. And so I'm just like waiting between the two, and I don't want to pause this video. So if that happens, I apologize, but I'm not pausing the video. I, I'm not good at the splicing videos thing. So anyway, here's our rock cycle. We should be pretty familiar with this uh, uh, from last week's work. Uh, but the, the main thing is, is we can start anywhere on this cycle and we can move through to any other type of rock depending on the pathway we take. So if we look at the top here with our igneous rocks, so we could take igneous rocks and we can weather and erode them like we talked about before and they become sediment. And then when they're lithified, they become sedimentary rock. That same igneous rock can undergo heat and pressure and become a metamorphic rock. Then this metamorphic rock can undergo weathering and erosion, become sediment, and become the sedimentary rock. Or it could uh, partially melt into a magma, cool and solidify, and form igneous rock. So all of these can just follow this cycle. Anything can become the other just through this transfer. Uh, so the rock is composed of uh, just grains of different types of minerals. It's just an aggregate of minerals. We talked about that last week. And then this rock cycle shows us how one type of rocky material is transformed into another. So this is a very, very powerful graphic. I would have this up whenever you're doing the adaptive practice because there's always gonna be something along the lines uh, that the rock cycle will be useful for. Does this concern anybody up here as you're watching this? You're like, this is only page three of 44. There's not 44 slides, trust me. Uh, it won't be it won't be that brutal. So let's start with the igneous rocks. That's our focus for this evening and for this uh, class period. Um, so we have two types of igneous rocks. We have igneous intrusive and igneous extrusive. So right now we're going to look at extrusive ones, and we want to take the prefixes and understand them. So extrusive think forming exit, like a uh, you know they're outside of the uh, earth when they form. Uh, the extrusive exit if you can make that connection it'll be clear for you going forward and so uh, extrusive igneous rocks they form when lava erupts at the surface uh, when the melted material is within the earth we call it magma once it's on the surface of the earth we now have lava and as that lava cools uh, it cools really quickly because the temperature and pressure differences from within the earth and the surface of the earth is extreme 
So therefore it cools really quick and it has these really fine grained minerals in there. Sometimes it's a glassy texture. And if it cools incredibly quickly, it is completely glass. And then we have like obsidian, you know? Uh, and so this igneous extrusion, that is the lava coming to the uh, surface. So the next time you're watching a video of like a, a volcano going off and like, oh my goodness, look at that igneous extrusion going on. Uh, and you'll win a ton of friends, trust me. That's how that's how I got all five of my friends. I'm joking. I don't have five friends. Now, anyway, going forward, igneous rocks. So the igneous intrusion. Um, so the intrusive rocks. So before we had extrusive rocks, which were formed outside of the earth, they exited. Uh, now we have intrusive rocks that form in the earth. So these ones never make their way to the surface. They don't get to erupt from a volcano. They just stay within the earth. Uh, they pond and they pool, and then they solidify into these big rock bodies. And so intrusive igneous rocks form when a magma, remember the magma is within the earth, uh, intrudes into an unmelted rock mass. So you can see from the pictures here, like this is like the melted material rising up. And uh, so this intrusion right here, it's just sort of ponded into this, what we call host rock. It's rock that's already been there. And then through different cracks and fissures, it makes its way up and it'll pond and pool. And it'll cool down. And since it has a long time to cool and a slow cooling process, we get these larger mineral grains. So we say that this slow cooling process produces coarsely grained rocks. And that's one of the ways we can tell. If you had each one of these rock samples in your hand, you could say without a doubt, this one was an extrusive rock. This one was an intrusive rock. This one formed from a volcanic eruption. This one formed from cooling within the earth. That's a very powerful thing to do just by picking up rocks and looking at them. Uh, but it's a very, very useful tool for geologists. Uh, so how the heck do we know that these igneous rocks formed at depth? How do we know? Uh, well, a lot of different things that we do. We have to look at the mineralogy and the chemistry. We look at the grain size. Is it coarse grained or is it fine grained like we saw in the previous picture? Uh, a lot of times they'll do a lab experiments uh, that require very high pressure and temperatures to form lab grain. So they can make Essentially, they can make lava in the lab uh, and then sort of study which grains crystal out uh, at certain um, temperatures. And um, also the re ways that we know that they form at depth is because we get um, outcrops. So you can study these big outcrops of rocks, which are just rocks that, you know, are sort of bare and open to go explore and study. And what they can find are what's called like contact or chill zones where the magma has made its way up into the host rock. And since the magma is much hotter than the you know rock around it, it will like partially melt some of the zones around it, like little outline of it. And so we can call that a contact zone or like contact metamorphism, which we'll get into when we talk about metamorphics. Um, but then it'll start to cool down just because the host rock is much cooler relative to the magma. And then uh, those will be like our chill zones. Um, and then we can also get what's called a xenolith of the country rock. So imagine if uh, this uh, blob of magma is making its way up through these cracks and fissures, and then it just sort of ponds in a certain area and then starts to cool down. And say there's like a chunk of the host rock, the country rock, that sort of breaks off and it goes into the melt, but that chunk doesn't fully melt itself. It's almost like a chocolate chip in a chocolate chip cookie. That's a xenolith. So there might be this, you know, a uh, similar body of rock uh, with a chunk of rock in there that looks nothing like the rest of it. It's chemically different. It's mineralog mineralogically different. It's just like that chocolate chip and the chocolate chip cookie. It just got sort of sucked into uh, uh, the magma and cooled with it. Um, and they're cool. To, they're really cool to see. And you you can notice these when you're out just looking at outcrops. If you see like an irregular shaped, uh, you know, darker rock within a lighter rock, you're probably looking at a xenolith, which means you're looking at a little chocolate chip of a rock that got stuck in a big pondy pool of uh, magma and cooled with it, chilled out with it. In the chill zone, <laughs> that's, that's where rocks go to be cool. You heading to the chill zone? Now nah, I'm gonna hang out in the magma for a little bit longer. Uh, I'm so sorry you gotta listen to this, oh my God. Anyway, so igneous rock identification. So we wanna have ways of identifying these and it is not as simple as this one uh, is a granite. This one's a granite. There are so many different names. There's granite, granodiorite, diorite, uh, gabbro, basalt, rhyol, and there are just so many different types of rocks. Um, and they're all different based off of their chemistry and their mineralogy. 
So igneous rock names are based off of texture or their grain size and their composition. So if we go with a textural classification, uh, coarse grained rocks are called plutonic rocks. So the coarse grained ones, remember, they form within the earth. Um, and so they form uh, or they cool slowly. They get the big mineral grains, very coarse grained. This is like our gabbro, our diorites and our granite. And they cool, uh, cool, cool slowly at depth. And if you uh, watch the video from the discussion board, you know that plutonic rocks come from Pluto, who was the god of the underworld. Makes sense, eh? Intrusive rocks form in the earth with Pluto, god of the underworld. They form underneath. That's cool. That's a cool connection. Um, it's not like it's some uh, philosoph or philosopher who got a rock named after him. That'd be so lame. But no, this is, this is a god of the underworld. This is you know his sort of a kitchen, if you will. But then the fine-grained rocks, uh, such as like a basalt, an andesite, a rhyolite, uh, they cool rapidly at the Earth's surface. That's why we get those tiny little mineral grains in there. Um, and these are volcanic rocks. And from the video, you know that Vulcan was the god of fire. So Vulcan, volcano, volcanic rocks, we can make that nice little meshy connection between mythology and science. They, they work together so well. It's a... Um, you know, like the mythology just is like the fancy coat of science. There's stuff you can wrap up in it and it's just really neat. Anyway, I'm sorry. So compositional classification. Uh, so these are just a couple terms you're going to be seeing in the CK12 work that we want to discuss here. Mafic rocks. So mafic means you are high in uh, iron and uh, usually uh, magnesium too. So the mafic rocks, which is like our gabbro and our basalt, uh, those contain dark colored uh, minerals, which are usually uh, very ferrous. Uh, you know, on the periodic table, iron's chemical symbol is Fe. That comes from ferrous. So they're ferromagnesian minerals. Uh, and so they're very iron rich. And so the silica portion, which we're not going to worry too much about, but it's only about 50%. It's not very high. Now, intermediate rocks, which are like diorite and andesite, uh, they contain roughly equal amounts of dark and light colored minerals. Uh, in fact, one of the ways when I was taking uh, uh, rock identification classes in college that I would always think of diorite is just cookies and cream. Uh, one that looks like it's just about equal cookies and cream, that's probably diorite. And then uh, the andesite is almost like the volcanic version of uh, cookies and cream, if you will. <laughs> it's the milkshake of it. No, I'm joking. But it's like the volcanic version of diorite. And so since they contain roughly equal amounts of light and dark colored minerals, that's one of the ways you can identify them. And then we have what's called felsic rocks. You're going to see felsic in your adaptive practice, but felsic means it's very high in silica. Silica being like quartz and silicon. And so uh, felsic rocks, which are like granite and rhyolite, they're very light colored uh, minerals. So it's a light colored rock. And so you can see just based even on color, we can start to narrow down huge portions of these rock stories of where they came from, how they crystallized. Uh, it's just amazing what you can do with just the littlest bit of information. And so all these rocks just have a story to tell. So any geologist you meet is nothing more than like an earth historian or an earth detective trying to figure out the clues of how things are the way they are. And it's a beautiful science. So igneous rock textures. Uh, you will be quizzed on this uh, in the CK12 unit as well as on the adaptive practice. But so texture refers to the size, the shape, and the arrangement of the grains. So that is uh, what texture refers to. And so the texture of igneous rocks is always controlled by that cooling rate. If they can cool for a long time, the texture will be larger grains. If they cool quickly, smaller grains, very rapidly, glassy. And so extrusive rocks cool super quickly. And uh, like, like we said, they're very fine grained. Usually this is, uh, the grains are less than a millimeter across. So very, very small. Uh, and then intrusive rocks, they get to cool slowly because they cool at depth uh, and they get very coarse grained. These ones get to be larger than a millimeter. That's usually around our cutoff point. And you can sort of see the difference uh, in the pictures here. And you notice the penny is in there for scale. So you can kind of see uh, the difference in grain size just between the fine grain rock and the coarse grain rock. You can see uh, the minerals are very much different in their texture. All right. So uh, igneous names are based off of the texture and the mineralogic composition. Um, meaning that uh, the minerals that make up the uh, rock will also help sort of define the name. And um, 
So we're not going to dive too far into this. This gets way more into like mineralogy than it does into the uh, igneous rocks. But it's just one of the things I want to expose you to so that you know. Like um, some rocks that are, you know, so higher, like basalt over here, basalt and gabbro. You're going to see them sort of dominated uh, some by like olivine. There's going to be some of the, uh, you know, plagioclase feldspar in there. But you also notice you have really none of the quartz. But if you go to rhyolite, you're going to have, you know, a lot of the quartz, a lot of the feldspar. Uh, you're going to have some biotite, but you are not going to have like the olivines and whatnot. Uh, the ferromagnesian minerals are just not going to be present there. And that has to do with the cooling rates with the magma and the, and the chemistry and whatnot. Uh, whoops. Let me click to the next one. And so how do they get in there? How does this, uh, how does this melty moosh make its way through the crust? Uh, and so what happens is in like bedding planes of like sedimentary rock, which we'll talk about next week, uh, but sedimentary rock is just like layers of different, you know, whether it be sand, uh, clay, you know, a conglomerate. Um, so it's just different layers. And so those layers create areas, especially when they're compressed or stretched and they crack. Uh, they create little like uh, cracks and, and fissures where magma could make its way up uh, or make its way up and then pond in certain areas or make its way up to the surface and be volcanic. So these intrusive rocks, uh, they exist in the bodies or structures uh, that penetrate through or cut through pre-existing country rock. So the country rock will be what it is, but these intrusive rock bodies just sort of make their way through, sort of exposing every weakness, every crack, every fissure in these rocks uh, as they make their way up in, in these little uh, slivers that are called dikes. And then as they start to um, sort of spread out uh, like a little more, we call them sills. So they can sort of pond up in these sills as they make their way through the dikes. And so shallow intrusions, uh, which are typically our dikes and our sills, they form less than two kilometers beneath the surface. And they chill and solidify quickly, uh, not only because of the cooler country rocks, but since they're so close to the surface, you have a higher temperature gradient. I'm gonna take a quick drink of water, I'm sorry. All right, so we also have what are called plutons. So Pluton, Pluto, God of the underworld, we gotta think underneath the earth. So these are deep magmatic intrusions. I mean, you have like these huge uh, uh, bodies of magma making their way up through the crust and they form at considerable depth beneath the surface. So they're just rising blobs uh, because of the differences in density. And so these are called uh, diapirs. So they're just rising blobs of mam uh, magma and they get trapped within the crust. And if they can't make their way to the surface, they just slowly cool down. And as the layers above them get eroded away uh, in different geological processes, then these giant plutons get exposed. And we'll be talking about very famous uh, examples later on. So one that we'll talk about right now is the shiprock in New Mexico. Uh, I'm heading out to New Mexico later on this month, and I'm going to try and convince my buddy to go here, and I'll take some pictures. Um, but anyway, so this is what it looks like today. But if you looked at it in the past, you, there'd be this big former volcano over it. And this would be part of uh, the magma chamber in there. And this would be one of those uh, dikes that we looked at before that was almost like a conduit for some of the magma. But as this overlying surface just gets eroded away through millennia and millions of years of just, uh, you know, surface processes such as wind, water, snow, rain, takes it all away and erodes it all away. But the rock that's down below is a little bit harder. So this rock doesn't erode away because it's harder and it's stronger but it leaves a remnant, sort of like a little skeleton of what once was. So this giant volcano that was once out in New Mexico uh, is now just this beautiful rock body that gives us insight into what the geologic setting was in the past. That's pretty powerful. All right, so with intrusive rock bodies, uh, so we, have, we can have a volcanic neck, which is a shallow intrusion formed when magma solidifies sort of in the throat of the volcano. That's what we saw in that last one. I'm going to hop back real quick. So you have that right there. And so that would be your volcanic neck. And then the dikes are just tabular intrusives uh, that are structures that cut across any layering uh, in the country rock. So if the country rock is like this, the dike will come in like this, you know, not on the same plane with it, but uh, sort of cutting through it. The sills are tabular intrusions that are parallel to the layering country rock. So if the country rock was sort of stacked as such, the uh, uh, you know magma would come in uh, up parallel to that, and it would form what's called a sill. Already, 
trying to keep an eye on the time so I don't make this one an hour. So this is how magma forms. Once we in increase the pressure, once we increase the temperature, uh, the, the rocks will start to, uh, uh, you know, break down, melt, form the magma, magma mush. And so a uh, melting temperature of, of granite is around 650 degrees Celsius. Basalt is 1,000 degrees Celsius, and that's due to the different chemistries, uh, which gets into the bonds, which we're not going to get into. But we will mention the geothermal gradient because they do talk about that briefly in your CK12. And that's just the rate at which the temperature increases as you go down into the earth. So for about um, every kilometer you dig down into the earth, it's going to go up about 30 degrees uh, Celsius. And so as we get deeper and deeper, it gets hotter and hotter. And that's why we find the magma, uh, you know, further down in the Earth's crust. And so the volcanic geotherm is higher due to the rise of hot magma gases uh, or compositional changes within the magma chamber. Um, so, like I said, we're not going to dive too far into this, but we wanted to talk about the geothermal gradient um, just because it, it plays a big rate or a, or a big role in the rate at which magma uh, can form or rocks can partially melt. And then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all we want to say on that one. Let's not dive too far into it. So melting temperature can be affected by uh, a lot of things. So the temperature at which some of these rocks and minerals melt can be in affected by increasing temperature. So if it gets hotter, it makes more sense that they'll melt. And also a decrease in pressure. Because when something is pressurized, you have to make it hotter to boil. Uh, and so if you decrease that pressure, you can lower the melting point. Um, and uh, uh, sort of evidence of this, I mean, just think about uh, like a soda can. You, you can put so much pressure and uh, like gas into it, but once you pop the top and you decrease the pressure, all those gases escape. And so what's sort of happening is the same thing here. Once overlying rock layers uh, are, are taken away or we have a decrease in pressure, like magma following a conduit to the surface, like a volcanic neck, um, once we have a decrease in pressure, it will rise up super quick and sort of uh, create a uh, volcanic eruption, if you will. Uh, but anyway, getting back to it, that decrease in pressure will um, affect the melting temperature of the magma. And uh, the addition of water, uh, magmas are, or rocks that have a lot more water associated with them uh, tend to melt faster. And that's why uh, you'll see a lot of uh, volcanoes that are like coastal, like the Andes Mountains. Um, they're right at what's called a subduction zone. So you have one big slab of the earth going down beneath the other with all this water trapped in from the ocean, which lowers the melting point and creates the Andes mountains. And then also a mixed mineral composition that does affect the melting temperature. Some minerals um, melt at different uh, temperatures than others. And so if we want to look at uh, heat versus pressure, so the melting point of minerals generally increases uh, with increasing pressure. Um, so as you put more pressure onto it, the melting point goes up. It takes more heat to make that melt. And then decompression melting is what can occur when hot mantle rock moves upward and pressure is reduced enough to drop the melting point. So it's this magma is under so much pressure under the earth, but once it gets closer to the surface of the earth, uh, the pressure is going to incredibly uh, decrease, which would uh, allow what we call decompression melting. So it's not as compressed anymore, and they could melt much more easily already. So we are getting close to the end. Just stick with me. This is a couple of uh, quick things we want to get through. So melting temperature, hot water under pressure. So water becomes increasingly reactive at higher temperatures. And uh, we don't have to worry about the reactivity of it. Uh, but as you include water into uh, the pressure in the melting, you're going to lower your melting point. So highly reactive water vapor can reduce the melting point by over 200 degrees Celsius. So you wouldn't have to have it be that hot in order for it to melt, essentially is what that's getting at. And then mineral mixtures. So mixtures of minerals such as quartz and potassium feldspar, those can uh, result uh, in uh, the melting at hundreds of degrees lower than either mineral would melt on its own. Uh, but since they're sort of mixed together, uh, the chemistry that goes on allows for a lower melting uh, temperature. We don't have to get into that. That's just for our information only. All right. So uh, this is magma melting, and this is a uh, gets more to the mineralogy of it. There's no real questions on this, but it's included in here, and it's a cool graphic. So if you want to take time on it, by all means do so. It, it's a pretty cool thing to see uh, where things will melt and then where crystals will sort of crystallize out. And that all happens in what's called Bones Reaction Series. 
And uh, we're not going to dive too far into this. We just want to look at the order of certain things. So minerals will crystallize in a predictable order. So geologists know which minerals will crystallize at certain uh, sequences or certain times in a, a magma body's life when it's at a certain temperature and pressure. So, um, so this, uh, I'm sorry, I got a little sidetracked. So minerals crystallize in sequence with decreasing uh, temperature and they sort of melt in the reverse order of what we're gonna see. So this is the order in which they crystallize. So you're gonna have olivine, then pyroxene, amphibole, biotite, the feldspars and quartz. And so uh, you can see here, as the temperature decreases, that's when these start to fall out. Uh, that's when these uh, minerals, you know, will form crystals and fall out of uh, the solution, if you will. And so the thing to take away from that, because they'll mention this a little bit in the uh, CK12 work, is that a variety of igneous rock is produced by a variety of magma compositions. So just how like you can have a bunch of different cookie doughs to make a bunch of different cookies, a bunch of different magma compositions will make a bunch of different rocks. And uh, mafic magmas will crystallize into basalt or gabbro. Those are our mafic uh, minerals and, and rocks, which are high in iron and magnesium. Intermediate magmas that are kind of in between will crystallize into diorite or andesite if minerals are not removed. And the uh, andesite and diorite, almost like a little mixture of like a, like a basalt gabbro rhyolite uh, granite. They're a little in between. And the Andes Mountains are made out of andesite. You know, a little, little connection there. And then minerals melt in reverse order of that which they crystallize from a magma. So if they crystallize first, they will melt last. And if they uh, uh, mineralized first, they will, uh, I think I just said it, they will melt last. If, minerals, if they mineralize last, they will melt first. Uh, sorry for getting tongue tied there. You tried talking about geology and rocks and minerals for what, 30 minutes here? It takes a while. So what we're going to get into after this, uh, after next week when we move into plate tectonics um, is, I'm sorry, after we talk about uh, metamorphic and sedimentary rocks next week is plate tectonics. Got a little excited there. I apologize. Uh, but so igneous activity occurs per primarily at tectonic boundaries, which we haven't talked about before. But the only thing we want to mention here is that those mafic rocks, those ones high in iron and magnesium, they typically form a divergent boundaries. And it's mainly all that basalt um, and gabbro uh, because there's increased heat flow because they're very close to a magma body and you have decompression melting uh, just because they're at spreading centers so you have a drop in pressure. Uh, when we have convergent boundaries, which is when plates come together, uh, they typically produce intermediate igneous rocks. So the high pressures and the high temperatures that uh, come from the collision uh, of these, also along with the water uh, that's sort of released in the melting of this, yields us to have uh, andesite and granite uh, type rocks. All right. And so when we talk about felsic rocks, which were the ones that were higher in the silica content, uh, these are rocks that are commonly found adjacent to convergent boundaries. So when we get into convergent boundaries, we'll talk about this a little more. That's where we find the ones that are higher in silica. And then the intraplate volcanism, which is like the Hawaiian Islands, which we'll get to talk about later on. This is mainly uh, uh, the uh, basaltic type magma that, that will crystallize quick and uh, give us the basalt rock. And there we go. Once we reach the blank ones, we are done. So that is your lecture. Watch as many times as you like. If you have questions on anything, let me know. Okay. See you.